All right, so this is work with my PhD students, Jane Lang and Arsene Vasilian, and, um, and all the technical questions should go to them because I'm too tired. Um, so anyway, this is about properly learning monotone functions via local correction. So I guess if I want to just say that this is a paper which um, gives a connection between learning algorithms and sublinear time correct, um, correction algorithms. So it's, um, so hopefully I'll be able to make that clear. All right, all right, so let's just start. Since this is about monotone functions on the Boolean cube, let's just remember what the Boolean cube is. I think we all do, but um, every vertex of the, Boole of the n-dimensional Boolean cube can be written as a zero, one string, and there's a natural partial order on the Boolean cube. We say that x is less than y. If for all i, xi is less than yi, so, um, and notice in this partial order, many strings are not related. So for example, 110 and 011 have no ordering between them. Okay, so that's, so what's a monotone function? In a monotone function, um, if x is less than y, then f of x must be less than or equal to f of y. Okay, so that's a monotone function in dimension three. Uh, notice that the number of nodes is two to the dimension. So that's all obvious, but um, I just want to make it clear because there's lots of ends in this talk. Okay, so this is our picture of a n-dimensional um, monotone function, and I just want to mention a couple of other definitions. We're going to talk about the distance of a function from monotone in this talk, um, and in particular, when we define the distance of two functions, we are going to use the Hamming distance, not L1, not L2, Hamming, okay? So it's the fraction of the domain on which two functions disagree, and our distance to monotone is going to, oh, and I want to say that we're going to use epsilon close very often. Epsilon close means that f and g differ on at most epsilon fraction of the domain, okay? So it is not an L1. I just want to make it clear. It's not L1. It's Hamming distance, okay? Later I will talk about L1 a little bit. Okay, distance to monotone is the distance to the closest monotone function. Um, so I have some function. It may not quite be monotone, but I want the closest. Sorry, since you were making a big deal of it. Isn't, because these are Boolean values, isn't L1 and L2? Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, so, it's, so it is L1. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> All right, I, I did not sleep enough. <laughs> these Arson and Jane wouldn't have gotten wrong. That's just, <laughs> so just don't blame them for me, okay? Um, All right, so why monotone functions? They received a lot of attention in testing, which I'm not going to tell you about till later and learning. Um, this is some, some references, but you can't read the references because it's just a bunch of letters. But I just wanted to make it clear. <laughs> what I want to impress you with is there's a lot, okay? <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, um, all right, so what, I wanted, so what do I want to tell you about? So there's, a, I mean, there's, an op there's a, a gap here between what we know about the sample complexity and the runtime complexity of properly learning monotone functions, all right? So what do we mean by learning? You're given some samples, xi and f of xi, and they come from some, you're guaranteed that they come from some monotone function, call it g, and the samples are, you know, the x's are iid uniform. What you're supposed to do is output some g hat that's close to g, okay? So I just need some predictor for g, something that gives me uh, something approximately good for g, and further, and up till there it was, I mean, up till this first thing, that's learning, but properly learning is to ask the g hat is itself monotone, okay? So it's not always required that what you, your hypothesis is a member of the, uh, I mean, that what you output is um, from the hypothesis class, but here we, we are asking the g hat be monotone, okay? Now for this talk, I am not gonna worry about this epsilon close business. Um, we're just gonna assume epsilon is some kind of arbitrarily small constant because I'm not gonna give you all the dependencies on epsilon. They're actually not that bad, but they're, they're not quite polynomial, but they're not so far from polynomial. So, um, okay, good. Now, the sample complexity for properly learning monotone functions is, for, sorry, what we know about properly learning, I'm gonna describe why in a minute, so this shouldn't be obvious, but I just wanna summarize what I'm about to describe. What we know for properly learning monotone functions is the sample complexity is two to the O tilde square root n, okay? So that's sublinear, the domain size is two to the n. It's sublinear in the domain size. It is not polynomial in n, but it is not also two to the n. So 
This is something not very non-trivial. But until now, we did not know an algorithm with runtime that was 2 to the little o of n. OK, so let me describe this learning algorithm and what the bottleneck was. OK, and I just want to mention, stress that this was even given query access to the function. OK, because often give it, being given query access makes you speed up your algorithms much faster. You can use things like Goldreich Levin, Cushy Levis Mansour. Um, but he, even given query access, we didn't know how to do this better. OK, so let's see why. Let's see why we know what we know. And it actually goes back to 96. Bichudi Tamon said that for improper learning, the sample and time complexity of learning monotone functions is 2 to the O tilde of square root n. Because what did they say? You get these samples, and it turns out what they said is you really just have to learn the degree square root n Fourier coefficients. And if you learn good estimates of the, all the degree at most square root n Fourier coefficients, and you output a polynomial g hat, which is the sign of this thing, then um, you're going to get something that's epsilon close to g. Okay? Now, it's not guaranteed to be monotone because it's a bunch of Fourier coefficients. You don't know what they're doing. But this is not guaranteed to be monotone. But it is going to give you something that's epsilon close to g. Now, how long does it take to estimate all the degree root n Fourier coefficients? Well, every Fourier coefficient on its own can be estimated from random samples in like 1 over epsilon squared time. No problem. But the problem is, how many do you have? Degree root n, you have n to the root n of them, which is 2 to the O tilde of root n. So I'm going to be using 2 to the O tilde of root n. Okay? But it's, that, that is why we get a runtime of 2 to the O tilde root n, to output something that's close to g, but it's not proper. Okay? So that's one thing. Now, you could say, great, maybe, I, maybe now that I've done the improper learning, I just find the closest monotone function to this polynomial, and I'm done. OK. Um, and in fact, I, we, we don't need new samples to get learning. OK, so this is, why is the sample complexity 2 to the, OK, this is supposed to say the runtime complexity. So the sample and runtime complexity is, um, no, this is sample complexity. Thanks. OK, so this is sample complexity. Um, for sample complexity, I run Bishuti Timon. I get something that is close, but not monotone. And then I do something brute force. No new samples, OK? No new samples at all. And, but running time I'm going to spend. And I'm going to find the closest monotone function and output that, OK? And this can be done. So that's 2 to the o tilde root n, sample complexity. But the time complexity is um, not clear. All right. So what's an idea? Maybe what I could do is write down the, I mean, I learn this function. It's not monotone. I write it down at every point in the domain. And then I solve this linear program and find the closest monotone function. But that's going to be polynomial in 2 to the n, because I have to write down the value at every point in the domain. So that's not obviously going to work. Yeah? But even, OK, but naive brute force would be like 2 to the 2 to the n, right? Because I look I brute force over all functions or something, right? So even this is better than. Yeah, but we're going to do 2 to the root n. Okay, instead, awesome. of, instead of 2 to the end. But, but yeah. really naive, it would be even worse, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Right. So I, but I would do like an LP to get 2 to the end, and then it wouldn't be totally brute force. So good. All right. So the difficulty is I need something where the number of constraints is, that, um, is smaller than, significantly, significantly smaller than the size of the domain. OK. Um, and what I'm going to show you is, an, um, OK, so. Um, what I'm going to show you is an algorithm that runs in 2 to the O tilde of root n. And this is essentially optimal um, due to a lower bound of uh, Blay et al. given query access. OK, so all right, so good. So what we need is something, OK, so let's think what's the problem. We have a small description of a close to monotone function. OK, g of x is a polynomial. It's a sign of a polynomial, but it's a polynomial, and it's small. It's 2 to the square root n terms. So it's a small description of a close to monotone function. Now, can we find an efficient description? Let's say the for, I'm going to use the form of a circuit. Um, you can think of it as a program, but it's actually a circuit, um, which is an algorithm that corrects the close to monotone function. OK, so it doesn't have to correct the whole monotone function at once. Otherwise, this would need to be a very big circuit. All it needs to provide 
is local access to the big monotone function. So what this corrector algorithm is, is actually a query processing routine. This, um, let's see. What the corrector algorithm gets, it gets is x, and it's going to output the corrected function, the monotone version of g, the close monotone version of g, at x. So it doesn't have to write down the whole g sub month. It just has to be able to correct x for you. And it doesn't have to do it from scratch. It is given access to this. I don't think this is working so well. Um, OK. It's given access to that green box. OK, so it's given query access to the green box. All right. Now, if we can do that, if we can get a green box that also has small description size, then we could just output both. OK, so I can output the close to monotone function g. And that um, provides answers to the queries for the corrector algorithm, which is also small. And together, they describe completely g sub mon, which is a monotone function. OK, so if both those boxes can be described by small circuits, we, we have a chance. Is this clear? This is what we're aiming for. All right. So good. So let's talk about local correctors for monotonicity. What are we going to do? We are going to take a function that's alpha close to monotone. And we are going to output something that's monotone and not too far from the original. OK, and it's going to be some parameters, 2 alpha plus some epsilon. OK, so I just, it's not going to be, I mean, so I just want to make it clear. We're going to get something um, a little bit farther than alpha from the original. Uh, we're not necessarily going to get the best. If the thing was alpha close to monotone means there is a function that is um, monotone and alpha close to that first one. But we're going to get 2 alpha close plus another additive error of epsilon. And we're going to basically take a circuit, which is defined by the output of the polynomial of Bishuti Tomon, add it to the corrector, as we saw before, the green box. And it's going to give us a circuit C prime, which is a bigger circuit, because this circuit, every, t every place where it makes a call to the Bishuti Tomon thing, I have to stick in the, the circuit for Bishuti Tomon in there. OK, so this is a circuit that's defined. You know, it's like small, but it has some oracle calls to Bishuti Tomon. Every oracle call to Bishuti Tomon, I have to fill it in with the circuit for Bishuti Tomon. So I have to multiply the sizes of these circuits. And I get a circuit C prime, which is bigger, but not going to be too much bigger. Um, it's going to be bigger. It's going to be the multiplication of these two. And so it's going to be, since the corrector is going to be 2 to the O tilde of square root n, I'm going to multiply it by the size of the circuit for Bishuti Tomon, which is also 2 to the O tilde of square root n. And I'm going to get something that's still 2 to the O tilde square root n. OK, so that's the plan. All right. And then the proper learning algorithm would just be run Bishuti Tomon, apply the corrector to it, and that gives me something that's order epsilon close to g and monotone. That's our plan. OK. Good. What about the agnostic setting? So maybe your function wasn't actually monotone. And you still want to learn the best monotone function that you can. So let's say, the, let's say I have a function um, f, and it's not quite monotone, but I want to learn it with the best monotone function. Um, oh, sorry, we're calling it g. Um, what we want to do is get something that's good compared to the optimal monotone function for that input function. OK, so if you take Bishuti Tomon and add to it the work of Kalai, Clivens, Mansour, Servetio, you can get an agnostic learning algorithm, which gives you error at most opt plus epsilon. And the runtime will still be 2 to the O tilde square root n. But it is, again, improper. OK. This plus R corrector is going to give a semi-agnostic learning algorithm that's proper. The error is going to be 3 times the opt. So we're getting a, a worse multiplicative factor in our opt plus this epsilon. OK, and our runtime is going to be similar. OK, so how are we going to do this corrector? Now, what does a corrector do? It takes a large object and fixes it so it has a specified property. And, these, um, and it needs to also be local, which allows it to be fast. It needs to provide sublinear time query access to the object. So this has been studied, I'd say, over the last 20 years for various properties. 
Uh, for example, or actually 30, if you include locally correctable codes, um, locally correctable codes, linear and low degree polynomial functions, these 30, 33, okay, so, so lots of years, so many decades. These things, these notions of correctors have been studying for codes, for polynomials, for linear, lots of types of, of uh, properties, and in particular, even monotone functions uh, over various domains have been studied, how to correct them, okay? Now, I'm just gonna mention there's some citations, um, but previously for the hypercube, we didn't have good correctors for, um, the good enough correctors because the dependence on the dimension was too high. So it was more like two to the, some constant times n as opposed to two to the square root n. Okay, so this is the technical problem we have to solve here is how do you get local monotonicity correction on the Boolean cube? And I just wanna give a sense of why it might be non-trivial. Okay, suppose I have this function here that's mo very close to monotone. Most of the ones are above most of the zeros, but you've got this little spot here of ones. And now, somebody makes a query in the middle of this red section here. Okay, so they're in the middle of this section here. And you look around your point and it looks good because you look, you know, you're one and everybody around you is one, so you feel like you're, you're good. Why do you have to correct it? But uh, obviously you're not because you're just in this like neighborhood, which when you look at the whole cube is actually a very, very small portion of the cube. But for you to go looking around much farther than this neighborhood would take you a long time. Okay, so how do you know whether you've seen enough of your neighborhood um, that you can say, oh, I'm in a good place, I don't need to change my, my value. Okay, so that's what local correction needs to do. Is that clear? All right. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna forget about these ideas. We're not gonna correct by just looking, doing a BFS around my neighborhood and seeing if I'm consistent with my neighborhood. That's what we're not gonna do. What we are gonna do is something a little strange. We're gonna look at, um, so to describe that, I'm gonna start describing that, but to describe that, I have to first uh, talk about what we mean by a violating pair. So if x is greater than y, but f of x is less than f of y, then we say x and y are a monotonicity violating pair. Okay, so these, this is a violating pair. This is what we're gonna base everything on. Okay, and now what I want you to notice is that when you flip the function value between x and y, it's only gonna make you closer to any monotone function. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's the optimal monotone function or some other monotone function, maybe it's like, but it doesn't matter what the op monotone function is, flipping the value of x and y makes you closer. And this is easy to see by case analysis, right? Because if you have some monotone function g, then if g of x is, um, oh, okay, it can't happen that g of x is zero and g of y is one because g we just assume to be monotone, right? So that can't happen. Case two, g of x um, is one and g of y is zero. Then when you flip, then you're gonna agree with g on those two points. Case three and four, g of x is either all, both zero both on x and y or one on both on x and y. Okay, in those cases, if you flip, you keep the same distance from G. So it doesn't matter, okay? So flipping may not make you closer, but it won't make you farther, okay? Also notice that if you have no monotonicity violating pairs, then you're monotone. So that's, um, so what we're trying to do is we're gonna be flipping monotonicity violating pairs. And at every point, our, our error will not get further, but at some point, we're just gonna be monotone. Okay, that's gonna be the plan. All right, so why is this, um, it's all, there's also a helpful idea, which isn't, shouldn't be clear yet why this is helpful, but I just wanna mention that it, we could do lots of these flips at the same time. If we find a maximal matching of monotonicity violating pairs, then we could flip them all at the same time, um, and that would be totally fine. Now, why is that helpful? Um, we'll see soon. Okay, now what, are we gonna, we wanna find a maximal matching of these monotonicity violating pairs. What is the graph we want to find this maximal matching on? So it's not gonna be the hypercube. So this is what I wanna just make clear. When I talk about maximal matchings, it's not gonna be on the hypercube graph. It's going to be the following graph. Well, it's not even gonna be this graph, but it's gonna be something like this graph, okay? Um, it, you're gonna put edges 
between u and v if u and v are related to each other, if u is less than v or greater, yeah. So if u and v are related to each other, if u is less than v. So, in, so this means the transitive closure of the hypercube. Okay, so there's a lot of edges in there. And it's also required that u, v be um, on a tonicity violating pair. Okay, so, so th that's gonna be, so take out all the edges where you don't have monotonicity violating pairs. Now you still might have high degree. Um, by the way, I just want to say, how do we figure out if u and v are monotonicity violating pairs? We're going to be able to, we're just going to query bishuti tamons output, and that will tell us if it's a monotonicity violating pair. So kind of, once you have bishuti tamon written down, I can query it um, on x, and on u, and on v, and I can figure out if these guys are monotonicity violating. Okay. Now, the degree of this graph would be huge because we were taking the transitive closure of the Boolean hypercube. What we're going to do to keep the degree down is focus only on the middle layer of the Boolean cube. This is a standard thing that everybody does, okay? So we're, stand we're sticking to the middle rows that are root and distance from the center row. Okay. All right. This will let us have a bound on the degree that's um, 2 to the O tilde root n on the transitive closure. Okay, so that's, that's why this helps. Okay, so now I want to take a maximal matching, but I want to do it in a local way. And this is a, there's a connection to the local computation algorithm model, um, which we proposed in, um, over a decade ago. And what this does is it provides fast queries to a large output and answers questions such as, okay, I've, I've got this graph. Is uv in the maximal matching? Is edge uv in the maximal matching? And this query processing unit should be able to answer it faster than computing the whole output. So it's going to give us a small circuit. Okay, so we've got, this is our like local computation algorithm. Here's that blue, okay. That blue thing is the local computation algorithm. We're assuming that it has some kind of access to the input graph, that it can ask about vertex v and get back the neighbors of v. So it has queries to the adjacency list of the graph. We'll talk about that in a second. And now we ask this local computation algorithm whether edge E is in the maximal matching, and it tells us yes or no. Okay? And what, um, it's also a randomized algorithm, and we provided a short random string. Okay. So what are the requirements? It should be memoryless. It should not remember the past history of the queries that you've asked me. Okay? So it should be able to reconstruct any past answer it gave on its own without remembering. Okay, this is um, this rules out like just following the jet, the basic greedy algorithm, because for the basic greedy algorithm, and I have to know which were the questions you asked about me previous. It doesn't rule out all greedy algorithms, just the basic one. Okay, and cr also I need that if somebody goes and makes all the queries, like some like independent copies of the local computation algorithm, are given these edge queries, they're going to say yes and no in a way that's consistent with a single maximal matching, okay? Now, just want to make it clear. Like, if you ask, I mean, it's very easy to answer, is edge uv in a maximal matching? The answer is always yes, okay? Because every edge is in some maximal matching. So what I want, what's the difficulty here? Is it's in some maximal matching, but I need it to be consistent with other queries that were asked, and I don't know what they were. Okay, so somebody else asked about edge wz, and somebody else might have asked about edge v, vy, and I have no idea what the answers were. And I still need to answer in a consistent way with all previous questions and whoever else asked. Okay? And I need this thing to be small. All right, so let's say delta is the max degree of the graph and n is the number of vertices. These things, local computation algorithms for maximal matching have been studied. I'm actually missing some. I should apologize, I'm missing some references in here too. Um, but what I want to say is they started being exponential in the degree, which would not be good for us uh, because our degree is already pretty, it's, our degree is going to be 2 to the root n to begin with. Um, but after a long sequence of um, works, uh, Ghaffari has shown that you can get local computation algorithms for maximal matching that are run in time polynomial in the degree. Okay? And in fact, um, 
previously in 2018. Okay, so I just want to say that either of the past two results, Gafari or Gafari and Wito, um, both of those are good enough for us, um, for our purposes in this work. But basically what you need to remember is you can get a local computation algorithm for maximal matching that's polynomial in the degree, and moreover, polylogarithmic in the number of nodes. Okay, so the number of nodes in our graph is going to be exponential. It's going to look like two to the end. But we're going to be polylogarithmic in that. So we're going to be polynomial in the dimension. Okay, and that's important for us. Okay, so this can be done. I am not going to describe it. Okay, that, so I'm just black box this part. Okay, so I just want to say we, d d maximal matching LCAs for these have been studied for lots of other reasons. One possible is coordinating non-communicating agents and dealing with really big, large data, but let's leave that. We're going to use LCAs in a different way. We are going to use that their description as circuits is small. How much time do I have, 15 minutes? Uh, I don't think your session shared. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. It's okay. All right, so good. So it's actually good for you. The less time they give me to talk, the better. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. So now I'm trying, okay, what we're going to try to do is we're trying to come up with a small circuit for a proper learner. And this is the part where things, you have to just be able to keep track of what I'm doing here because we're going to have circuits that call other circuits that call other circuits and then we have to argue um, that when you make those oracle calls and you start sticking in copies of the circuits for each of the oracle calls, everything still works out. So just trust me that it does, I think. And I'll, I'll try to convince you that it does, but trust me, it does work out. Um, but what are, this, what are the components of the circuits? So we said we had this learning algorithm of Bichudi Tomong. We have a small circuit for that. Check. Okay. Now we have this, um, we just said we need a monotonicity corrector. Okay. We're going to give a small circuit for that by giving an LCA for maximal matching. But then the LCA for, and okay, so we're going to give a small circuit for correcting by giving a small circuit for matching, which we already have, but we're going to have to show how we can use that to do the correcting. And then the worst part is this maximal matching assumes that it has um, query access to the graph, okay? What graph? We need a small circuit that represents the graph. So what I'm trying to show you now is that we can, that whatever this LCA needs, queries to the graph, is something we can give it a small circuit for. Okay, this is not hard, it's just like a detail. All right, so if, um, so I just want to claim you can represent graphs, neighborhood queries via small circuits for some graphs, not all graphs, but some, the graphs that we're dealing with we'll be able to represent neighborhood queries with small circuits, okay? So what these small circuits do is they're given a vertex V, they're gonna output the neighbors of V, um, and I'm claiming, okay, and I'm claiming there's some circuit that can do this. It might be big, it might be small. In our case, it's gonna be small. So our neighbor oracle calls will have small circuits. So let's just think why. Why I'm not saying something crazy. Remember, we're dealing on the hypercube. Now, the hypercube clearly has small circuits. If I give it X, then you can easily just take x and for every bit flip of x, output that. You know, take x, every possible way of flipping one bit of x, output it. Okay, a small circuit can do that, right? Okay, so now I'm just saying we're doing Hamming distance L. So for every possible L bit flips of f, output it. And then I know the direction. But then I want to know which ones violate monotonicity. Okay, so for every possible L bit flips of f, call Bishuti Tamon, see what the value is. Okay, and then, you know, and so, and then compare that to the value of my current node and see which ones are violating monotonicity. So I'm claiming, yeah. What, so uh, what, what, what access, what kind of oracle does this uh, LCA for max matching need to the graph? It needs to be able to make neighborhood queries? Like I, need, I, need, I give it a vertex and it tells me all and the neighbors. Yes, yes. Okay, but naively to get all the neighbors in this um, uh, monotonicity violation graph, I need to like, Query every guy who could like I, I, I have you. I want to know who are his neighbors. So that's everybody who's in a monotonicity violating pair with you. So I need to like query everybody who could be related. Yeah. To so you. like everybody. I mean, if I'm a one, I have to look at everybody oh, above me and make you, sure there's no zeros. And there might be. This is why you restricted yourself to the. Yes. The, the, yes. The, the, the I, I want to keep the degree of this graph low. Right. So. Okay. So you're gonna only gonna like given you, you have to make root end queries. Right. So what, what I want to make sure is if I look at you, I mean, I don't want, I, you know, I have to look at, yeah, so I, I mean, if I don't restrict myself to the, to the middle here, oh, I don't, I'm not very good at drawing cubes online, but 
okay. So I'm claiming this thing could be really big, but I only need to look at this part, okay? Um, and then for each of these, I, ha I mean, if this, was a z if this was a one, for each of these, I just have to make sure that um, if any of them was a zero, I just will do a brute force here and look and see if any of them are a zero, that will be my neighbor, okay? So that's the, um, that's the idea, okay? Yeah. Great, I will talk about that. Thank you, thank you. I think it might even be on the next slide. Yeah, okay, good. So I, um, this is gonna be the graph we deal with though. All right, um, so I just wanna claim that because, this, because of this assumption that we lopped off parts of the hypercube, which I, basically why is because I drew it badly. I should have drawn it more like this. And this should be, okay, it should be more like this. Okay, and that, this thing, there's not much there. That's the idea. But there's also, if you look at what's above u, it's actually two to the O tilde of root n um, in this, this whole shaded area. Okay, so you can just go, I mean, we're looking for circuits of size two to the O tilde of root n. We have time to go through that. Okay, we're gonna go through, look at everyone, Everyone query from Bashuti Tamon what's the value and figure out which one is a violating pair. Okay, so that's the graph we're interested in. Um, actually, any other questions? Because this is like, I mean, I don't want to lose you yet. Yeah. I'm sorry, just, just a specific question about what the answer is for this. Um, does it tell you whether an edge is at any maximum matching or at a particular maximum? It, it has a particular maximum matching in yeah. Thanks for that question, actually. Let me go back. Um, it has a particular maximum matching, maximal matching in, in mind. And I think I didn't explain this well, so thanks. Um, and it's, it's a particular one in mind that is actually defined by that short random string. Okay, and every, every, okay, so all the LCAs that have that same random string will output according to a single maximal matching and it will be legal. Okay, um, and that's, because there, as you may have realized, I think from your question you realized that there are lots of maximal matchings. How do you pick which one? And the point is you can show, I'm not gonna do it now, but you can show that a short random string is enough to pick one, okay? And it's not saying that every maximal matching will get picked, it's just saying it's, these are picking enough that you'll be able to do this. Okay. Where were we? We were, okay, so now I'm claiming if I have a circuit that outputs, that solves these neighbor queries for me, then Gafari, all it called was, I mean, it assumed it had neighbor queries, and that's also a circuit, because it's in, you know, we can hard code that as a circuit. So, it, so now we take this circuit that does the neighbor queries, every time Gafari's algorithm call, needs a neighbor query, we just instill a copy of this circuit in there, okay? And also we're gonna just hard code the random string that gets used into the circuit, so everything's fine, it gives me a runtime for the transform that, okay, it runs something for the transformation. Gafari's algorithm is polynomial in the degree times polylogarithmic in the number of nodes times the size of G, which is the circuit for the graph. Okay, so that's how it looks. So what we're gonna do is basically take the circuit for the function that was close to monotone. This is the learned thing that came out of Bashuti Tomon right here. And we're gonna go through a sequence of transformations, which I'm gonna describe a little bit, but not fully. So we're gonna go through this sequence of transformations, and then, um, and then it's going to give us something which is totally monotone, and hopefully not too far from where we started, okay? And that's how we're gonna do the proper learning. So let me describe the sequence. The first transformation is a little bit different, but it's kind of an easy truncation, um, which we've kind of talked about. And the rest of the transformations all look the same. Okay, so the first transformation we do is just truncation. This is kind of standard, but important. And that's just to notice that the very top and the very bottom of the Boolean cube, it's not that many nodes, okay? It's a, it's, you can bound it by a lot less than epsilon, okay? By picking this distance bar. This distance is going to be some function of epsilon times square root n. Um, but as long as you look at 
nodes that are farther from the middle than this function of epsilon times square root n. So anything that's, um, okay, so just we're going to focus on the band that's between n over 2 minus o, o of square root n and n plus 2, n over 2 plus O of square root n. And the claim is everything else we're just going to truncate. What do I mean by truncate? Without even looking at the function, I'm going to set all those top guys to ones and all the bottom guys to zeros. Okay, that changes a lot less than epsilon fraction of the, this is a standard trick. Um, and what it helps us with is, as we saw, it helps us keep the degree down. Okay, now the other thing, so what I want to talk about now is, now what are the rest of the phases doing? So for that, I need to define something called the max violation distance. That is the largest hemming distance among all violated pairs. So that's saying, okay, there's a violation between things this far or this far, what is the maximum distance um, in my violations, in my violated pairs? Okay? Um, and, okay, so what we're going to do is a series of phases, each time cutting down the max violation distance in half, okay, until there are no more violations left. Okay, and that's basically the plan. Maybe I should um, just say, I guess what I want to say is this, that I want to, we're going to have, we're going to cut them in half, the max violation distance in half at each phase, and that's going to be enough for us. Um, I think I'm not going to get into too many more details, but I just want to say that um, you may wonder why this is giving us the right answer, because we're constantly changing our function, so maybe we're changing it too many times. But um, in particular, we're changing this function log n times, so maybe our error is going up by a function of log n. But I'm going to claim that the total error of this part, of this kind of continual thing, is going to be at most epsilon. So why? Um, well, when we truncate, we get distance. We already said we get distance less little o of epsilon. Um, and now look at the best function, the closest monotone function to the truncation. Okay? And notice that when, okay, so I'm, I'm comparing to the closest monotone function to the truncation. And what we argued before is that when we swap monotonicity violating pairs, we do not get farther from any monotone function. So in particular, not from this monotone function. So if we were epsilon far to begin with, we're still going to be epsilon far from this one. Okay, so now the thing we output there, um, we can bound its distance to this one, and that bounds the distance to C0, and then we bound the distance to C. Okay, so that is one way of doing it. There are better ways of doing it, but hopefully that convinces you that our error doesn't go out of, out of proportion. Okay, all right, so it's not, the error is not going to look like log n times epsilon, it's just going to be a constant times epsilon. Okay. How do you implement one stage of this correction procedure? Um, we want to claim the max violation distance halves in each phase when you take a maximal matching and fix it. Okay. And there's just basically a lemma that we prove, a technical lemma that says that that happens. Okay. So it says that if you pick a maximal matching in the violation graph, okay. So, so actually, one thing. It's a little bit different. The graphs I said before, you would have any violations, but now we're looking at only far away violations at each phase. Um, so if you look at violations that are at least k far away, but you're given from the previous round that the max violation distance is 2k, okay, then this new k violation graph is only going to contain violations between k and 2k. And what the lemma says is that if you do a maximal matching of swaps on these violations, you're going to kill everything between k and 2k. Okay, so you will no longer have any violations in that range. And so a maximal matching will reduce your violation distance, your max violation distance in half. Okay, so I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, but, uh, okay, I think we've already covered. The, just, I want to just say that the parameters actually sound like there's a lot of parameters and they go crazy. But just notice that the max degree in our graph is going to be n to the o's, basically 2 to the o tilde of root n. And the number of vertices is 2 to the n, but our running times are going to be polylogarithmic in 2 to the n. So it turns out that we are getting something that's 2 to the o tilde root n times the circuit that does the ith phase of the correction. There are log n phases of the correction. They call each other recursively. So you kind of have to multiply this thing. 
um, log n times. So you're going to get 2 to the O tilde root n times 2 to the O tilde root n times 2 to the O tilde root n log n times. It's still 2 to the O tilde root n. Okay, that's the beauty of tilde notation. Uh, and so this is all going to work. So in summary, we get, um, we get even a semi-agnostic proper learning algorithm, which gives sample, sample and runtime complexity 2 to the O tilde root n. And its error is at most 3 times op plus epsilon. And this is essentially optimal. Um, I'm going to skip this. And then you might ask, can we get fully agnostic proper learning? And, and what, because we're getting something that gets error opt. And the question is, can you get a proper learning algorithm that has, er, we're getting something that has error 3 opt plus epsilon. And can you get something where the error is at most opt plus epsilon and proper? And that's a question. Um, so that was an open question, but I'm running out of time. I just want to say that Jane and Arson have actually solved this in recent work, in really beautiful recent work. So can I take an extra minute to just say something? OK, thank you. Um, OK, so our previous method was run a fully agnostic improper learning algorithm based on low degree polynomial regression. And we know that, um, OK, so we can show that that approach itself wouldn't work. But what they do instead is they run this special almost proper learning algorithm based on low degree polynomial regression via the ellipsoid method. And then they output, they require via the ellipsoid method that this output is epsilon close to monotone. And among those functions that are epsilon close to monotone, um, you should aim to be as close as possible to the original function. Um, but what they do is they, they do this with an LCA implementation for Oracle queries. And then for the second part, uh, here they need L1 correction procedure because what they get back from the ellipsoid is not a binary function. So here they need an L1 correction procedure to make the hypothesis monotone. Okay. And there they use the LCA that's kind of built and more complicated than the, on the one that I kind of tried to explain to you just now. Okay. So they use an LCA in both parts. And um, okay, I think. I think what I'm going to do, because I'm out of time, is I'm just going to encourage you to look at this paper because I think it is so cool. Uh, it is, um, and they, they really came up with this really interesting connection between the ellipsoid algorithm and LCAs and the, the low degree descriptions of matchings that you can push off to the, to the ellipsoid algorithm to define a separating hyperplane. And it's really um, a really cool paper. Um, it's on archive, so you can look it up. Um, and I'm just going to basically move on to um, Oh, I'm going to mention one more thing. If you want to additively approximate how far a function is from monotone in sublinear time, their algorithm allows you to do it um, to, to within some error epsilon. Um, and I just want to mention a couple of open problems. Um, doing something similar for convex sets. We know how to um, agnostically learn convex sets. Uh, can you make it proper in 2 to the little o of n running time? There's some challenges here. You need to figure out how to discretize Rn. If you're going to use our LCAs, there's some challenges. Then you need to discretize somehow. And furthermore, um, we don't know how to locally fix convexity uh, unless you're in two dimensions, which is, is not the interesting case here. So, um, so that there's basically not sure. Um, and I think I'll skip that open question because it's the part of the talk that I skipped. So I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Like reduces the Hamming distance between the farthest violating pairs by half. Is there some easy way to see that it will reduce it at all? Like the maximal matching has to like include maybe some very far apart violating pairs. Okay, so all the all the violating pairs are somewhat far apart because in the graph, what I think what I tried to mention, but I think I didn't say properly enough, was that um the the graph we actually gave to the maximal matching um was things that weren't too far apart, but also things that weren't, weren't too close. Okay. So we didn't give it edges that were too close. Now we do a maximal matching on things that are really far apart. And so now, you know, all the things that are far apart, we did a maximal matching and they got switched. Um, 
And if you could have switched something further, then you would have. And so there's so I, I don't have an, no, I actually don't have an easy way to say why a maximal matching is enough because why it doesn't leave even one person. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't have an easy way to say that. But, uh, but anyway, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> okay, no, it's a, it, there's a proof, there's a, yeah. We got two, actually. Uh, so we, we got one, okay, one from the Bishuti Tuma. Then we truncated, there's another epsilon. And then we had another epsilon um, to the closest opt. Is it the opt that's closest to the truncation and the opt that's closest to the original Bishuti Tuma? We had to argue about that too. So there were, there were lots of opts. <laughs> and, um, and they weren't all the same, so. That's it. 